All right, so we are in week four of our four-week series. We've been talking about this series called Body Life. What can we learn from the early church? And our purpose has been to, to not mimic them, but to figure out the principles of what they were doing, what Luke is trying to tell his audience, and then grasp those principles. God saying to us in 2022. And so before we go there, though, I want to let you know what we're going to be starting on February 13th. So we won't be here next week, the 13th. We're going to start a series called Reminders, where we're going to be studying First and Second Thessalonians. And so last year, where we studied the Gospel of Mark, who scholars say was the first gospel, Thessalonians, most scholars would completely agree that it is Paul's first letter. And so just an amazing letter to this amazing church in Thessalonica that he's reminding them of what it looks like to be Jesus Followers, And so we're going to kick that off on February 13th. Should be a lot of fun. It's going to be 12 or 13 weeks. Take us through Easter. And then we'll go someplace else from there. But first and second, Thessalonians. All right. Wednesdays, if you vet to join us on Wednesdays, man, we had a great, I, I thought it was great, a great meeting last Wednesday, great brainstorming, great discussion, great thoughts going through on some really difficult topics, and so if you have yet to join, one last Wednesday talking about body life, we're going to do some challenging questions again to really get at what the purpose of the church is in this community right now, okay, and so we really want to have those good discussions, so if you haven't joined us, join us on Wednesday, all right. So let's get, get back to Luke. Now you know this, you've seen this already, but we have been looking at the summary passages. Scholars would say there's probably about nine summary passages in, in Acts where Luke is trying to summarize what's occurring in this early church. And we're going to look at six total, we'll look at five of those today, but we've looked at six total of, of trying to figure out what is Luke telling his audience about this church. And so reminding us that Luke wrote in the early 80s A.D., but he's writing about a time period from Pentecost to about 62 A.D., about a 30-year period that he's recording the history of in Acts. And that underline is what I want us to just be in us all the time. Luke is trying to encourage his audience to say it is the Holy Spirit who allows the church to discover and rediscover its mission. We want to hear that today, right? We want to hear that in 2022, that it is not us, it's not Tim, it's not the church. It is the Holy Spirit that should be leading us and uncovering for us what our mission is as individuals, but as the corporate body here in our community and around the world. And we, we should never settle, right? We've been talking about that. We should never settle and think, we've arrived. You know, we figured it all out. This is exactly what we're going to do for the next 10 years. Right, because culture is changing, the world is changing, the Holy Spirit, if we're listening, is going to keep us in tuned to how we should be serving in our community. Okay, so we want to have that in us, even as we get into Thessalonians and talk about this, this very early church that Paul plants and what it was like for them and the challenges they faced and as they had to discover their mission. And we want to do that today as well. Okay, and so we want to keep that in us. All right, so what have we learned? What have we learned over the last three weeks? You should be able to say this, right? We've learned that the body gathers. Luke makes it absolutely clear that they gathered to worship. They gathered to be taught, right? They gathered to pray. They, they gathered to share the Lord's Supper. They gathered to, to share life together. They gathered to eat, hence why we're eating today. The one thing we haven't done together, right, is we haven't gathered to eat as the body, hence pizza being provided to be able to do that. But the body gathered so significant we get that right it's not just a, a one-hour meeting a week and we're good we don't have to worry about body life anymore not that we're all supposed to gather together all week long but we should be gathering with believers on a regular basis right to gather in smaller groups to worship to pray to eat to, to share life we should be to be part of what we do is gathering together we learned also that this body in the early church cared for each other how did they do that it says luke tells us that no one had needs Right? The body met one another's needs. So as a need arose, people sacrificed, sold property, whatever they had to be able to meet the needs of the people in the body. Very significant thing, right? That the body of Christ, that none of us sitting in this place here, anybody connected to us should have a need, right? There's enough in this body to provide for everybody's needs that exist. And so one of the ways I've challenged the deacons and what we're going to do this year is you might find they seem to be a little more intrusive because they're going to be asking you, do you have any needs? Right, we're talking about that. Like, we want to know because a lot of times we feel ashamed, right? We feel like I can't really say that maybe I need some groceries or I'm struggling to pay for my medication or maybe I'm struggling to make rent. We struggle with that, right? And so, as deacons, we're going to be asking you, What are your needs? And you should feel free to say, Oh my gosh, you know, I might need some help because we want to help one another. 
Okay, we want to help one another. So the body cares for each other. Well, what we saw last week is the body cares for those outside the church, right? They didn't withhold the power of the Spirit to themselves and say, hey, this is great stuff. Let's put walls up and, and contain ourselves because we got it. They went to where the people were at and they shared the gospel, but what they did more than anything else and how they shared the gospel, right, was by performing signs and wonders, right? It was through the miracles that they were performing amongst the people, not withholding that power that were causing the people to be like, wow, this is pretty amazing. And remember, we defined miracles as maybe providing food for someone that hasn't had food for a while, providing a home for someone who doesn't have a home, right? To those folks, those are miracles, right? We don't want to discount what God is doing in us provide miracles for the people around us. And so we always want to be going out. We don't want to just hang a sign on the front and say, hey, just come here and we'll help you. We want to be going out to where people are at, seeing what needs are and meeting the needs of those who are in our community. Okay, so this is where we've been. And so where are we going? All right, we're going to look at five summary passages. They're all going to be on the screen today because I don't want to be flipping through, through Scripture as we're doing this, this that quickly. And so five summary passages where, where Luke tells us something about what's going on in this body. And what he's telling us is it is growing. And he uses amazing words about it's being multiplied, right? It, it, it's just You get this idea that this, this is booming, that this new believing church, right, these new followers of Jesus who are risking a bunch amongst their family and friends, right, in this Jewish culture, risking it all to say Jesus is Messiah. And Luke is telling us it's growing like crazy. And he says, here's how it's growing. He says, God is adding. God is doing the growing. So here's what we want to unpack today, is we want to see how the body's growing, why the body's growing, right? And understand that, and understand our role in the growth of the body. And so let's take a look at 247. Now the words right before praising God, the dot, 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 is, is, is that the people, the, the Jesus followers, had glad and sincere hearts, okay? So this new group of, of believers that Jesus is Messiah, they're, they're excited, they're happy, they're, they're grateful, they're just thankful, glad and sincere hearts. And what are they doing? They're praising God. And so in the midst of their gatherings, they're just praising God for their new life. And then it says they had favor with all the people. Now remember we defined this last week, the peop, all the people are those that are outside of the body not the leaders we know the leaders are still struggling with this new sect right they thought they killed their leader and so by killing jesus they felt like hey that'll it'll squash them but what they're finding is it's actually what multiplying so they have favor with people and then what does it say what does luke tell his audience he says the lord added added the Lord added to their number day by day. It was the Lord who was doing the adding, right? The, and we're going to talk about how that was occurring and what the people were doing, right? As the people lived out what God had called them to live out, being obedient to what God had asked them to be obedient to, the Lord grew the body. The Lord added to the body. And he says, those who were being saved. And I want to spend a couple minutes on this word saved because I think we've really dumbed this word saved down in our culture, in our Christian culture today, right? This word, this word saved, we've taken, we, I think when we think about this word, we, we think, oh, you prayed a prayer and you're going to heaven, right? That's how we sell the word of salvation is, is oh, you prayed a prayer and you're going to heaven. But for those, that early church, and it's what, what it should be for us today is it is so much bigger than that, right? This idea of, of God saving, this idea of being one with Christ is so much bigger than praying a prayer and going to heaven, right? And those folks would not even have looked at it like that. And so scholars try to piece out what would Luke have meant by this word salvation, a word that means essentially God's adding, right? When you're saved, God is, is adding. And so they, they trace Luke from the beginning of, of his gospel through Acts. And we begin to see for Luke, this, has, this, this word salvation has, has this tremendous meaning of, of a life in Christ and what it looks like. Words he uses in his gospel, right? Good news to the poor, release of the captives, recovery of sight for the blind, freeing of the oppressed, forgiveness of sins, the work of the Spirit in me, signs and wonders, that, that salvation is actually being aligned with Jesus, and being aligned with Jesus means this. It means I'm going to free the oppressed. It means I'm going to bring release the captives. It means I'm going to bring good news to the poor. It means I understand I have forgiveness of sins. It means I, I'm allowing the Spirit to work in me. It means I'm about signs and wonders and performing miracles and, and being the hands and feet of Jesus, right? 
Being saved is so much bigger than, hey, I get a ticket to heaven. Being saved and understanding that God added me to the fold says I'm aligned with the mission of Christ. Church, we want to get that. We don't want to dumb that word down. We don't want to dumb it down for ourselves. We don't want to dumb it down for our culture. Being saved says God has added me to this fold because I'm now aligned with him and the mission he, he had for Jesus on earth and the mission he has for us on earth. All right? Let's continue. 5, 13, and 14. The next summary statement. But the people, the masses, the people outside of the body, held them in high esteem. Okay, once again, Luke is saying, look, these people were liked. This early church was liked by the people. Well, why were they liked by the people, we might ask? Well, they were out amongst the people, healing them, freeing them, performing signs and wonders, right? Freely among the people. They were ministering freely to the people without an expectation of anything in return. I would like those people, right? We would like those people. Hopefully that's us. And more than ever, believers, and we'll come back to that word too, were added to the Lord multitudes, Multitudes, not a few, a couple, you know, here and there. Multitudes of both men and women. So much in this passage, right? So they were added to the Lord, those who, who believers, in the next phrase we'll see, faith in the next passage, same Greek word, believe, faith, same word, essentially means you're a Jesus follower, right? So more than ever, Jesus followers are being added to the Lord. Those who are following Jesus are being added. And then a great number of men and women, now, this is huge that Luke calls out men and women because in a patriarchal culture of 80s A.D. and even when, when, when Jesus was alive, right, you were calling out women. But Luke is saying everybody has access to Jesus. Everybody has access to Jesus. There is no one that can't come unto him. And he is making sure his audience in the 80s, in the midst of continued Roman persecution, understand that, that whoever wants to come to Jesus, God and Jesus are open to receiving them. Okay? And so we're told again, multitudes are coming. So we continue. Uh-oh. Go ahead and advance me there, please. And the word of God in 6-7 continued to increase. That means, as most would believe, that means they're planting seeds. They're continually out performing signs and wonders, talking about what Jesus is doing in their life. And the number of disciples, what? Multiplied. Multiplication's big, right? Bigger than addition. So the disciples are multiplying greatly in Jerusalem. And so in the epicenter of Judaism, these new Jesus followers, this new sect of Jesus followers is exploding multiplied multitudes right i mean it's much, the number must be huge and a great many of the priests now i think we think initially oh that must be the high priest most scholars would say no those there it's not the high priest but there's other priests that exist within jerusalem they became obedient to the faith meaning they became followers of jesus okay they said and agreed with the teaching that jesus was messiah okay so when i become obedient to the faith in that culture for sure it says i recognize jesus as the messiah i recognize him as the one that was prophesied about and who's coming to save his people okay and so they became followers of christ as the word spreads this new group of people grows okay we continue now we're going to go back to one I, i've skipped one here that we'll go back to in a minute 931 the church throughout all Judea, which is in the south, Galilee, which is in the north, and Samaria, which is in between them, essentially all of what we might call Israel today, had peace and was being built up. So throughout the church, Luke is saying, this is one of the last summary statements. There's a couple small ones later on. He's saying to his audience, like, look, essentially throughout all the land that we know, there's peace and it's growing. The body of Christ is growing. And, and what are these believers doing? It says they're walking in the fear of the Lord. Now, this word fear doesn't mean they're afraid of Jesus. This means they're in awe. They're walking in the awe of Jesus the Messiah. Okay, they're walking in awe of who he is. They're walking in awe of what he's done for them and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. We'll get back to that. And what happens to the body? Multiplies again multiplies again he says they're spread out now they're not just in jerusalem this body is spread out and they're walking in awe of who god is which which we need to really get back in our culture right i'm not sure how in awe of jesus we are anymore but we need to be in awe of him and revere him and and desire him but they're also on the holy spirit to lead them and provide the comfort and as they do that luke says the body grew so how did it spread that's what we're going to track back Chapter 8, verse 1. 
And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. So apparently the apostles get to stay in the Jerusalem area. It doesn't mean their persecution ends, but they stay. But the church scatters. Right? The church, the people leave the persecution that they begin to endure, and they head off to the north, they head off to the central, they head off to the south, right? They scatter all around. And then what does Luke tell us then what we just read in 931? It was flourishing. Because of the persecution. And so these people who were persecuted didn't get sent out as, as refugees, so to speak. They got sent out as missionaries. Right? As the persecution came and they went north or they went south and they left their homeland, they left in the power of the Spirit, in the fear and awe of the Lord as missionaries to love and serve and care for. And what happened when they did that? The church grew. Now, I want us to talk about this word persecution in a minute too because really, really when I hear people in the U.S. say, I'm being so persecuted, really, I, I, you don't understand what they're talking about here. Right? If we're trying to say that we've faced biblical persecution in the Western world, we had zero idea what, what these people faced in the Roman Empire. Right? We might be feeling like our rights or our liberty, liberties might be going, whatever, but persecution, not a chance. Because for 300 years, from, from, from Jesus' time until the early 300s, when Constantine unites the Roman Empire, during that entire time, there's only one 50-year period where there's zero persecution. So imagine that, and that's a little more than generation, but those of us who live greater than 50 would have lived during a time where people were being what? Killed. When we say persecution in Scripture, in the New Testament, it means death. Okay, they don't mean, oh, you got separated from your family, oh, you, you know, the person at your job doesn't like you anymore, or, um, you know, they told you you had to do this. No, no, it means death. And out of all those emperors, there was 54 emperors during that time period. Twelve of them were the persecutors, okay? So 12 out of the 54 doesn't seem like much, but there's always persecution happening. And at one point, and I think it's 249 I read, for two, two or three years, whoever the emperor was, whoever the Caesar was, he made an edict to eliminate all Christians in the empire. What do you think hap happened to the size of the empire of Christians? It grew as they scattered, as they spread, right? Whenever persecution exists as we see this in modern day and other places in the world the body of christ grows why because we walk in all the lord in the comfort of the holy spirit church we need that we need to understand the awe of walking and following jesus and being allowing the holy spirit to be our comforter and so this church, this brand new church, Luke says, this brand new people who are risking everything to say the suffering servant is truly the Messiah, are risking it all, they're risking it all. And the gospel is spreading. And Jesus' words are spreading, freeing the captives, liberating those who are oppressed, right? It is spreading throughout the entire region that they live in. So why? And so I really like, I realize we could, we could, go to all different parts of the New Testament, but, but Luke is telling his audience from his perspective through these summary passages why, right? He says God add, it was multiplied, multiplied, multitudes. So why? As we look at these summary passages, what do we see as to why the body grew? Well, we've talked about these three already, haven't we? Because they gathered. This is the body who needed each other, right? These people needed each other. They wanted to worship. They wanted to learn. They wanted to pray. They wanted to eat. They wanted to share the Lord's Supper, right? They wanted to share their lives together. And so when we gather, we're not isolated, are we? Right? When we gather, we understand the significance of the power of all of us versus one of us. When we gather, we recognize how we're, we're there for each other, and, and, we, and we have people to lift us up and carry us through when we need that. And so when we gather... It just binds us closer and closer and makes us stronger. But this body also cared, right? They took care of each other. No needy people in the body of Christ. Whoa! What a testimony that is for the outside world when we can say there is not a needy person that exists in the global body of Christ. Boy, I hope one day we get to say that. There should be no needy person in the body. But then what else did they do? They didn't hold that onto them for themselves. They took it out, they took it out, and they took it out, and they cared and met the needs of those who didn't know Jesus as Messiah. And they did not hold that power back. Church. And so when we, I believe this, when we live like this, when we gather and just love to be together, when we take care of each other and no one has needs, and when we're out being the hands and feet as God has called us to, that's an attractive 
group of people. The people don't like you, right? The people don't like us in the same way in the Roman Empire are those who are trying to control people, right? Those who are people who are trying to oppress people, those people who are trying to keep people on the margins, those people who are trying to keep people where they want them so they can control them. Those are the people that don't like the body of Christ. But people who you're serving and ministering to with love and kindness, and we're going to get to, the, get to another part here in a minute, with love and kindness, yeah. But why else? Well, they were liked because they were loving people, right? They weren't beating them over the head, saying, you, you, you know, you're a big sinner. You need to accept the Messiah. I can't believe you don't, loser, right? They were out loving and serving and healing. But I love what Luke also says in that last summary passage. They were in awe of Jesus. Church, I want us to get that back. I want us daily to be, wake up with awe for what Jesus did for us, what he's doing for us, and what he will do for us be in awe of who he is and what he's done and how he lived and to be in awe of how he's challenging us to to live and work and and minister to those around us and those outside of us to be in awe and then are we willing are we willing to allow the holy spirit to lead and comfort us when times are tough we're willing just to rest in the spirit when we might face ridicule we might face challenges because we are jesus followers are we willing just to allow the holy spirit to say it's all right it's all right. Your mission is way bigger. Your purpose is way bigger. What God has called you to is way more important. Just allow me to provide the comfort. Church, I believe as we, as we live in obedience and following him wherever he takes us individually and as the body, man, God will do a great work in us. But we have to get this. God adds. Man, we have to stop thinking it's us. Right? Our job is to do what he's asked of us. Right? Our job is to live the way he's asked us to live, serve the way he's asked us to serve, give the way he's asked us to give, go where he asks us to go, right? be who he wants us to be. Our job is to be obedient to how he asks us to live as individuals and the body. And then God will add. Now here's how I've seen that work in my life. Right? When, when I met my, my wife-to-be, she said, well, you're going to have to go to church with me. And I thought, well, that's a pretty good trade-off. Right? I get to date this gal and go to church. That doesn't seem so hard. Um, but, <clears throat> no, make no comment about that. Okay, but, right, I don't know how many times people tried to guilt me or shame me into being a Jesus follower. You're a big sinner. I mean, look at your life. Guilt and shame to add. I don't know how many times they tried to scare me. Well, you're going to go to hell. You're going to burn in hell. And, and I, I remember listening to these statements. I can still see this clearly going on like, how does, how does God love you and he's going to burn you in hell? How does God love you and, and you, should, you should feel guilt and shame for all your sin? How does that go together? Or they try to force you. Just come to this stuff. Do this thing. Do that thing. And, 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 I, and parents, this was a challenge too. I, I've heard this from kids after they've left their parents' home. Is my parents forced me to do this. They made me believe this. They made me do that. Man, what I found with all three of those categories, I've met them all in the body of Christ as I've pastoring is, is the guy that thought just, just felt guilted into it and shamed, he thought, he thought he was following a God of guilt and shame. When he met the real Jesus, his life was transformed and he was set free. The guy that thought he was going to burn in hell because of whatever reason, when he found out that God truly loved him and, and just wanted to, just to save him and free him, his life was transformed. The people that have felt forced into being a Jesus follower, when they discovered who Jesus was on their own, in their own way, transformed and freed as God did a work in them. Church, our job isn't to, isn't to try to guilt someone into heaven, isn't trying to guilt someone into the body or shame them or tell them they're going to burn or die or whatever those statements are or force them. Our God is to love and serve them and let God and the Holy Spirit do their work. And God will multiply, multiply, multiply the body. Now, I'm not, look, I'm not suggesting the guy in the street corner isn't called by God. I'm making no judgment or opinion on that. But as I look at Scripture... Right, as I read scripture out, I see a group of people who were passionate about the Messiah, who were passionate what they had done in him, who, what, what they had done in them, what, he, what they had seen him do, and as the message kept being passed down, how, how he had freed people in the midst of, of serious oppression within that Roman Empire, just sharing that love and that care and that concern and bringing the power of the Spirit out. And God added, man, let's not forget that it's God that does the adding. Okay? It's not us. Our job is to be obedient. Our job is to live the way he wants us to live. Our job is to sacrifice as he wants us to sacrifice, to go where he wants us to go. 
and be who he wants us to be and allow him to add. Because you know what changed my life? It was actually seeing people live out their walk. As we began to get integrated in this church, and I began to see people who were sacrificially giving and loving and living and serving. And when they would invite me into their home, they didn't say, you're going to burn or you're, you're guilty or you're a sinner or any of that. They just loved me in the midst of my craziness that, that wasn't pure in any way. And they loved me and they loved me and they loved me. And so I began to just say, oh my gosh, maybe this is real, and began to hear the lives of missionaries who would come and share stories of all they had sacrificed and seeing the joy in people who were truly sold out. It was through the testimony of their life that I began to seek the Lord, and the Holy Spirit spoke and added me. It wasn't anybody else's work. It was them living out the gospel. It was them living out their following of Christ that allowed the Holy Spirit to add me the being one of the saved one who was now on the team of jesus and who wanted to be like him live like him and go like him all right so that's how we want to be i want to share a quote here at the end now last week i shared a quote by a guy named shane claiborne i love i love this guy i don't agree with everything he said but i love this guy because he's a modern day guy that put his money where his mouth is moved into the inner city with the people he wanted to help right i i I can't argue with that. I mean, he, he's doing that. It's great. I'm going to share a quote by another guy, another guy that I would label an activist by the name of Craig Greenfield. Um, this is a guy that was born in America, I believe. Maybe Canada, not sure. Moved to Cambodia in the slums of Cambodia to walk alongside those in the slums of Cambodia to help them, assist them, and of course, live out the gospel. Created an organization called Alongsiders, walking alongside people exactly where they're at. Right, to, to love and serve them and, and let them see the love of Christ. And he wrote a book called Subversive Jesus, which is a pretty difficult book and challenging me. So this quote is challenging, okay? It's a tough quote, but it speaks to my heart. It's, it challenges me daily when I think about this, and so I want to share this again. And again, I share quotes not because I'm all in, but because I'm wrestling in the same way you're wrestling with, with what God is trying to do in our lives. So he says, When people ask me whether I preach the gospel to the poor, I echo the words of St. Francis. It is no use walking anywhere to preach unless our walking is our preaching. In other words, he says, unless I am living the upside-down kingdom of God, it is simply absurd to go around talking about it. Boom. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Oh my gosh, does that challenge me. I love that. Simply absurd to talk about something I'm not doing. Yeah. Isn't that truth? Simply absurd to talk about something I'm unwilling to do myself. Simply absurd to say, here's how you should be when I'm unwilling to be myself in that way. Church, we want to be challenging that way. I don't know what God is doing in us individually. I sure know how he's challenging me. I don't know what he's going to do in us corporately. But, but we, right, as we learned about this upside-down kingdom in Mark, right, it's a crazy kingdom that Jesus... Because the, the credibility is in saying, yes, we're going to be that, because then that allows us to speak. It gives us the credibility to speak about it because we're living it. So I want us to be challenged in that way. As we have finished this series and looked and saw the importance and significance of gathering and caring and meeting needs, not only here and outside, but we want to recognize that in the midst of doing all of that, God will grow us, God will multiply us, we don't need to be worrying about our, our people being added. We need to be doing what God has asked us to do. And God will be faithful and do what he does. And he will add people to his body. So as we walk into Thessalonians, right, as we walk into this study of looking at the challenges and travails of this very, very early church, Right? We want to have all of this in our minds, right? This, this church and how they live and the persecution they face. We want to have this in our mind about what they're willing to sacrifice, how they're willing to live for the sake of Jesus. And we want to constantly be asking ourselves, God, what do you have for me? Where do you want me to live? Where do you want me to move? What's the career you have for me? What's the calling you might have for me? How much more do you want me to sacrifice? We don't ever want to settle church. We always want to be seeking out the Lord. So as Lucas comes and Bill and Ian come to lead us in a, in a final, final song, just whether you sit or stand, just, just sit in God's presence. You say, God, what, what is it? What do you have? What do you have for me? What is it you're calling of me? What is it you're asking of me? And then be willing to say, yes, Lord. Right? Just say yes. As you hear it today, say yes. If you hear a new challenge today, say yes. If you hear God speak something brand new, just say yes. Whatever it is you want. Let's pray. Father, we... Well, I'm thankful 
for the people you put in my life early on that truly lived out the gospel, that truly lived out this idea of good news to the poor, bringing freedom to those in captivity, liberating the oppressed. I'm so thankful for those people. I'm so thankful that they, they loved me so much. I'm so thankful that they went where I was. They didn't expect me to come where they were. They went where I was and loved me there. And through that, began to seek you and want to know you, wanted to see if, what you, if you were really real and in the midst of that. Lord, you began to move and your Holy Spirit began to move and you added me. You did it. Lord, I pray for all of us. I pray our number one desire is to just follow you wherever you take us. From the more, minute we wake up in the morning to the minute we go to bed at night, that our desire is just to be followers. To follow you wherever you might lead. So God, continue to have your way with us. Continue to lead us. Continue to guide us. In Jesus' name, amen.